Hi, I'm Jennifer Dotson, and welcome to Poetry Today. I'm the founder of Highland Park Poetry and the program coordinator as well, and I'm really thrilled to have with me a special guest, Wendy Anderson, a Highland Park poet and author. Um, Wendy is uh, reading from her newest poetry collection, An Ancient Trail to Home. Wendy Anderson grew up in a town of just 600 in north central Maine and has lived in the Chicago area since she graduated from Beloit College in Wisconsin. She's a longtime professional writer and editor who taught in the graduate level journalism program at Northwestern University. She has interviewed and written about poets Galway Kinnell and Natasha Trethewey, and writers Jacqueline Mitchgard and Ingrid Hill for the www.bookslut.com literary site. Uh, she is also the founder of the Writer's Attic Creative Writing Workshops. And she's married, has two do do beautiful daughters, uh, and her previous poetry collection was Wild Things in the Yard. Please welcome Wendy Anderson. I'm so Thank glad you. to have you here. I've long admired your writing. Um, Thank you. you uh, and unfortunately, I, I do hope that you don't make me cry because typically when I listen to your poems, ah. I'm always like, I'm like <laughs> in the audience going, <laughs> you know, so I'll try to keep my emotions in check All when, right. when you're reading. I'll try to make you laugh. <laughs> oh, that's good, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, talk to me about this. So, this is a lot, there was a big gap between your first poetry collection yeah. and this one. So tell me about that process a little bit. About the gap or what happened? Well, I, um, sure. Yeah, both. it's been about a hundred years <laughs> okay. since my first poetry collection. Um, and I did that kind of right out of college when I was feeling very, you know, like I'm going to be a poet and I'm going to conquer the world and uh, I'm going to get books published and be famous. Um, and then life intervened for many years, and I still continued to do a lot of writing. Mm -hmm. And but I took a break from poetry. I was writing more fiction and essays. And then I I continued to write poetry always, but I didn't really do much with it. Mm -hmm. I would send it out here and there. And then at some point when I really reflected on it, I decided I have all these poems and I should put them together into a book again and see mm -hmm. if I can get it published. And I had heard of Finishing Line Press. Okay. And They're based in uh, Kentucky? Kentucky. Okay. And I saw that they had a contest, which was an incentive to put a book together and send it. I did not win the contest, but they did say they wanted to publish my oh, manuscript. Oh, okay. So that's how it came about, and I was thrilled. Yes, well, sure. So, yes, when anyone besides your mother says, we want to publish your poems. It's, it's like, yeah, okay. 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 <laughs> Yay, okay. Um, so, when, and when you were creating this manuscript, was it, I mean, were there poems that you didn't put in? That, yes. You know, so it was. Many. What, um, what were sort of the shaping elements for this particular chapbook? Uh, well, I put together a big chunk of poetry and I kind of tried to organize it in terms of points in my life, really. Mm -hmm. And then I had uh, a friend whose poetry I really admire go through it again for me okay. and change things around and suggest different ways to do it. And it also, I think it had to be 26 pages, something oh, okay. like that. So this is just she the best of the best. Me, she helped me pare down okay. and took out some poems that I really liked that didn't really fit. The theme of this, if there is a theme, is probably like from childhood to going to college to moving to the Chicago area, mm -hmm. which is very different from where I grew up in rural Maine, mm -hmm. and motherhood, kind of life in a quick summary. Okay. <laughs> well, actually, that I, this might be a good opportunity to have you read um, Sighting, the poem 
Okay. That's because that does talk about your early, uh, very early childhood experience. Right, and, and uh, it brings in motherhood. And and Maine. And Maine. All, all. Uh, um, here, let me get this out here. Sighting. <laughs> We were at the breakfast table when I told my girls about the first time I saw a moose. Not the storybook kind they knew, but a real one, that graceless, prehistoric creature from my main past. I was in pajamas then, too. They were pink. I was maybe five. I'd had a bath and was on my way to bed when a car pulled up. Bobby and Ron, my teenage brother's friends, had heard it on the CB. Someone on the Greenville Road hit a moose. This being a small town on a Saturday night in 1960-something, car accidents of this caliber were big news. Let's get up there, they said, and Lowry grabbed his coat. Can I go? Can I go? I begged my mother. I'll be okay. Lowry will watch me. Can I go, please, please? And for some reason, she said yes. I was a tingle in the backseat of a Chevy in the arms of a brother god. We zoomed through the pitch black on that long stretch of woods, and then lights ahead, lots of them, a single cop and a caravan of neighbors, Ansel LaPointe, the Almonds, the Favors. We coasted to a stop, and Lowry held my hand. There it was, halfway down the shoulder, a VW bug, baby blue, and there on the steering wheel, the head of a bull moose, driven so back and far back into the driver's side that its nose was crushed. Red painted the seat back. One antler rested on the passenger's side, one spilled through the driver's window. I could have touched it, we were that close. The once massive neck draped across the windshield in a crimson clump of rubber bands and paste. The legs splayed along the hood as if to ride it. Jesus, said my brother, Jesus Christ. I didn't ask, but I knew someone besides this moose had to be dead. I don't remember getting home. I don't know if I wondered at that age whether he saw it coming that young man from Connecticut, the flatlander we heard was driving, when enormous death slammed into him. This is all a memory, wrapped in the dark and the woods, in the protection of brother and in blood, in childhood and a mother's judgment, in fantasy and fear, and the beginning of loss. Mm. I don't remember when I first heard that poem, but it does, it was really... Stayed uh, with you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I, well, I, I um, as a, about that age, maybe a little younger, I took a vacation with my family. We went to Maine, um, um, and we saw, saw we saw a moose, although fortunately not in the same dramatic fashion that no, you had saw. <laughs> but we then came back to when we lived in New York and named our, uh, we got a dog and we named him Moose. Um, of course. But... Um, he wow. wasn't a little dog, I hope. He was, well, he had a big spirit, so. Good. And ears that would kind of, oh, when, yeah. you, when you said the word squirrel or park, they yeah. would kind of yeah. poke, poke Ready. up, kind of like Ready. antlers or. Right. So, right. Um, but, I, yeah. but I guess when, one of the things that's always struck me about your work is that you're, the, un, the um, lack of fear that you have as a writer to address scary topics and mm -hmm. scary feelings or scary things that make people frightened or uncomfortable or, um, and you don't yeah. shy away from those. Um, yeah. And is that a real, is that something that you gain from other writers that you admire or is that something that you just uh, develop just do. your own? Yeah. I think I actually have, d well, I'm not sure that's true. I was going to say I think that I do that more now that I'm older. Mm. But when I look at some of the stuff I wrote when I was younger, I think I was less, uh, I didn't censor myself as mm. much. Although I don't think I censor myself now either. Mm -hmm. It's different. It was probably more raw. Okay. Um, 
But I guess I just think that's an important thing about being a writer, at least for me, is to put that stuff out there and hope that everybody's had different experiences, but I want my writing to convey my experiences but allow other people to relate okay. to what I'm writing about, so even if their story would, might be a different story. Mm -hmm. So it's specific to you, but yet it has a universal theme that people that's, can... That's what I aim for. Yeah. I think when I'm initially writing, I'm just putting down my own. But then when I redraft, mm -hmm. and I, it's not like I consciously think about, oh, how are other people going to react to this? But okay. I have to be honest to what I'm writing. And that's what I tried to do here. Mm -hmm. And this was such a powerful memory and my brother this is my brother's Lowry's favorite poem of okay. mine because he's in it and I refer to him as my brother God yes. which I think he really <laughs> likes um, but I because he was there and yeah. he also had okay. this experience I'm sure he would write about it very differently sure but uh, I don't know. It seemed very important. And then as I was writing it, I didn't know the ending till I kind of got there. Okay. And then I thought about myself as a mother because I started out telling my own children about this story. Yeah. Would I have let my daughters get in a car and go see a car accident? <laughs> and probably not. Yeah. But, uh, but I did yeah. when I was five. So, anyway. Yeah. Well, I, I know that you also teach writing. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the things that you tell your students, or, or how do you <laughs> inspire them? I mean, uh, well, what I do generally, I give assignments. Um, and by that, I mean, we talk about different poets. I try to find really interesting, sometimes obscure mm -hmm. poetry. And we will read the poem and we will talk about it. But then I will take an assignment from that where I might be a line in a poem or it might be the topic of the poem and I tell them to write about it th themselves. Okay. Um, it could be like a Sharon Olds poem where I take a line from the poem and just say, go with it. Where does that take you? Write your own poem around that or something like that. Okay. It's fun. Yeah. It actually, I do think it gets them inspired. Okay. So. So is the act of reading other poets is an important part of your teaching process? Yeah. Okay. I think it's really important. I mm -hmm. think, uh, I think you can't be a writer unless you read a lot of good writers. Okay. Um, because even if you're not conscious of it, I think writing, other people's writing does inspire you and make you think, and I just think that's very important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hear people say that I want to be a writer or I'm a writer, but they don't really read very much. Okay. And I guess I just always assume they're probably not a very good writer. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I'm a snob. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> okay. That's how I feel. Okay. Well, no, and, 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 and it seems like you've, well, your work certainly stands as work that I would share with other students as uh, something to well, thank um, you. emulate or. Uh, feel free to do that. Okay. Uh, tell them they have to buy the book. I will. I will tell them that they have to buy the book and come to, the, to your reading on uh, November 22nd That's uh, right. at um, Madame Zuzu's. Yes, Saturday, November 22nd at 8 p.m. at Madame Zuzu's at 582 Roger Williams. You'll be reading. And um, now you said that we talked earlier that you're, the company is having a little issue with uh, the press, the actual press. So the book may not be ready by then or we're not sure. Well, or? initially they told me it would be out September 12th. Okay. And now we're like a month, a month after that. Okay. Um, but I did send the galleys back last week, so I'm hopeful. 
I hope it will be out by and November 22nd. Okay, well, knock, knock on wood. Has it, have they been a good press to work with? Have you been? Um, they have been. Um, it's a small press, and mm -hmm. I don't think they have a lot of people there. Okay. But, you know, they're very reputable, mm -hmm. and uh, they, I forget who judged the contest, but they, they've done, published some very reputable writers. And okay. So, so you feel like you're in good happy. hands? And yeah, I do. And did they, now did they do any, I mean, I, I know that your manuscript, you, you talked about how you'd had a poet that you respect and a friend uh, read your manuscript before mm -hmm. you were sending mm -hmm. it out to this contest, but um, did they provide some feedback? shaping and feedback of the, they or they didn't. just said they, this is perfect as is, we're going to publish they, it? They, that's what they said. Oh, I like that. <laughs> that's fabulous. This is perfect. <laughs> okay. um, no, I think. They did not make any edits or suggest okay. any rearrangement or anything, so. Okay. Maybe that's not what they do. I don't know. Maybe they just search for those those diamonds and... I would imagine they get it's tons of manuscripts, okay. like any press. So I was, you know, as I said, I was really happy that they wanted to publish. Yeah. Well, can we have an, another uh, sure. sample? Sure. Sure. Should I read New Baby? Yeah. It's another kind of main, kind of a main poem. Sure. Uh, New Baby, uh, my daughter, my daughter Emma did the uh, photo on the cover of the book, by the way. And this poem is about her not when she was at a place. It's called New Baby, so she was much younger. First visit to the family in Piscataquis, Piscataquis County, Maine. She is so far into my country, wading through my inland springs, tiny overalls rolled to her knees, and toes balled up like spruce gum against the cold. August sun sits in her cheeks, autumn rustles through her hair, and a milky curve of moon nestles in her thighs. Her belly is a canopy of night sounds, of cricket chirps and frog croaks, of April runoff and January hail. Birds soar straight down her legs, lift up her arms and startle her into trying too soon to fly. She follows an ancient trail to home. She is a fawn feeding on my flowers, a fox sniffing at my windows, a fat cub curled up and cozy in my chair. She is going out the back door and coming in the front landing like a flock of geese on the rug, all her squawks and busyness causing a ruckus and lighting up the house. She is a thunderstorm just started, a lightning shower at peak, and finally a dome of crisp, clear sky. She is my first star. Mm. Wow. Well, it's, it's, I like the fact that you sort of merged all these um, you sort of made her the physical landscape of your past and your where you yeah. come from into her, the, her body. Yeah, uh, that's I was inspired. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, okay. <laughs> yeah. I no, mean, when you watch little kids, they're amazing, as mm -hmm. you know, and uh, she was amazing. And you know, I've tried very, very hard. I have two daughters to give them my heritage and mm -hmm. to take them to Maine and to show them the woods and the ocean and the lakes and the wildlife. And I really kind of got going in this poem mm -hmm. and incorporated that into physically into her. Right. So it's one of my favorite poems. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you know, it's funny. I mean, I had read it before, but I didn't didn't connect until you read it just now. That that's where the title of your chapbook comes it from. It is. I, I like, thought of okay. that as I was reading it. Yeah, that's like, right. Oh, I took you? it from there. Okay. Yeah. It just worked. It does. It does. It does. So, work. yeah. Um, can you talk about your process, though, as as a writer? You, you mentioned in conversation earlier that sometimes you'll you'll write stuff and then, but it's not finished. And so, what is that? What does that mean? Yeah, what does that mean? I mean, and, and how long does this take? I mean, so 
what is for you a process? What would be your, you say, your process for writing a poem? Uh, usually it's a few lines or something that comes into my head from something I saw or whatever. And I write that down and then I just start expanding on it and crossing things out and playing with it and putting it, getting all the initial stuff down and then putting it aside because I really think sometimes you just have to put it aside even if it's two hours or a day or whatever and then looking at it in a fresh way and keeping going mm. and getting you hope that you get eventually to where you feel like this is done okay I mean I have poems that I I've never felt like they're done oh, and sometimes okay. you have to give up on them I think but okay it's hard because they're your babies and it's really yeah. hard to just say, you know, can't do this, it's not going to work. Okay. I don't know if you've experienced that. But. I, I suppose I have a few uncompleted uh, yeah. documents in my, yes. <laughs> my, yes. my zip file or zip drive in the computer, yes, okay. But you may finish them. I mean, I keep I everything because I think I may go back. I'm more of a list maker, like I'll, mm -hmm. I'll think of an idea of a sort of like a kernel of mm -hmm. an idea or a memory mm -hmm. like you started with with a memory and of something that you want to write about mm -hmm. and then and then sometimes I'll just turn to that list when I'm but lately I've just been too busy so I don't know. well there's that <laughs> that can go on a long time yeah. I mean, hence the gap <laughs> hence, the, hence gap. the long gap and I was writing through the whole gap but not putting it out there I guess okay well, and you talked about, um, you, in your bio, you mentioned that you have written about writers, and so you've mm -hmm. interviewed, you've been in my chair, and you've been doing more of that mm -hmm. process. Yeah. Is that, uh, how does that, in, does that inform your writing at all, or those, those interactions, or those um, exchanges? It does sometimes. Um, Natasha Trethewey was a really interesting interview. She won the Pulitzer Prize, actually, for poetry. Um, she is... African American and her book was called Native Guard and it was about African Americans who fought in the Civil War okay. and uh, there were other things in the book as well but we talked about that and about her heritage and and as she's she was very inspiring just to listen to her talk about her own writing mm -hmm. and you know, I can't say that it led me to go write something from talking to her, but it made me feel really good about being a writer and what writers can do mm. if people are paying attention. Um, okay. Because they have a lot to say, really good ones, yeah. about politics, about history, about life generally. And she was one of those writers I really liked. Galway Canal um, is kind of this bear of a man in the poetry world. I think he's in his 80s now. He was the hardest interview I ever did. Why? Why? Because he was so reticent. I would ask him a question, he would reply with three words. <laughs> okay. And yeah. then there would be silence. And oh, okay. the entire interview was like that. Now these were, were this wasn't a recorded interview. This was this was one you were and right. then you were so you were interviewing them and on telephone and, and then keeping notes keeping and notes. Okay, and, and then, Natasha I actually met. Okay, but uh, it, I mean it's just fun and interesting and a lot of, you know Galway Canal. I think he's someone who feels like he's done so much that he doesn't really need to talk about it anymore. <laughs> okay, and I kind of get that. You know. Okay. Well, we won't talk about it anymore. We can, um, let's, let's get one more poem. All you. right. Oh, hidden here. Should I do fear? Sure. Fear, getting kind of away from Maine. Um, fear. You cannot comfort friends whose child will die any day, indeed any moment, from cancer. You cannot press a hand and say, it's okay, it will be all right, you will get through this. You can only go in and out of their special circle, 
father, mother, brother, child, bake something, say a slender word or two, and listen. Listen when she says, if I knew when I was pregnant that I could have this child as he has been for only nine years or another for a lifetime, I would take him again. I wouldn't change that for the world. And you think, my God, how brave, and go on your way. Try to spend every moment with your own too. But every moment gets eaten by living. You take them to school, you take them to soccer, you help with a project, you read them a book, you run to work, you grocery shop, you clean, do wash and cook. You get mad at them too because you have these lists to get through that take time away from them. But some things you just must, so you do. It's at night when they sleep that you cry. You cry for your friend's exquisite love and for you. You sit by a bed and watch your baby breathe. You cradle your palm along her head and cheek and curl a tendril hot under her covers slowly over your hand. And you think how their father gave you a small, perfect sapphire to commemorate one girl's bluest eyes, an opal to match the other's new face, round as the moon. And you pray to God they stay healthy and whole, that they're not secretly growing death inside, because that's the one chore in your world of lists you don't ever want to work through. Mm. Well, it's a good thing that's not the first time I've heard this poem because I would be, you know, but even so, I feel like the, you know, my eyes start to, you know, <laughs> well up. And Sometimes this poem's a little hard to read. Yeah. Actually, I have yeah. a couple poems like that. Right. You do. Lots of death yeah. and dying and terrible things <laughs> Terrible poems. things happen. Dark <laughs> things happen. Scary things happen to, to all kinds. Yeah. They do. Yeah. Well, it's a scary world, and and I guess you're definitely your writing is definitely a witness to um, some, of it. some of that. Yes, it is. Um, it's beautiful too. It is. It is. I, I I like this poem, the fear. I love the just that one thing, this a slender word, mm -hmm. talking about trying to communicate with this grief-stricken family where you're just kind of, eh, you know. Well, you're not really in it. No. Right. And you can't be, and you don't yeah. want to be, but no. you are there. Right. Because you have to be. So. Well, you captured that yeah. uh, very, very well. And it's, I, I like, I mean, again, Thank and it's you. an unexpected use of the word slender. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an unexpected combination of, of words. Slender word or two. Yeah. yeah. And it, I, so it, 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 stand, it stood out to me as like, oh, wow, that was so, it's a, it was a surprise. Mm -hmm. But and it seemed to really grab that image of what you were talking about mm -hmm. with the thank you, you know, the family. But we're thrilled that you're going to be reading um, from this collection, an ancient road to home, ancient trail, excuse me, ancient Sorry. trail to home on uh, Saturday, uh, November twenty second at Madame Zuzu's. Um, I hope that we get lots of people come. I hope the place is packed and there will be people. Lining up out the door, all I'm eager, sure. all eager I'm to going buy to tell copies. them Bruce Springsteen will be there. Okay, that's so good. They'll, they'll be there. Definitely, Don't worry. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> they'll definitely, definitely want to come, and uh, um, you'll be reading a lot more uh, poems, and you'll have books for sale. Knock on wood. Yes, well, I'll try to do that. <laughs> really good. Um, and are you now that you've now that you've done this? collection are you looking ahead to a future book are you I actually I mean I haven't I have a memoir that I've been working on and working on for so long that it's embarrassing to talk about okay. that I would really like to finish that is not poetry okay. um, but I also would like to put together another collection and I do have some ideas about that so well we hope that you'll come back Thank you.